Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you here. Uh, it's, it's my great uh, honor and pleasure uh, to uh, introduce here the last speaker of this year's series uh, uh, at the Prague Center for Transatlantic Relations. As, uh, I first uh, do want to thank uh, specifically the Israeli Embassy and uh, Gary Koren, Israeli Ambassador, as, and the publishing house Garamond, uh, who are the co-partners, or we are their partners, uh, in organizing this, uh, this short lecture and then uh, as the questions and answers uh, time. Uh, so, and I will thank them uh, both to the Israeli Embassy and to Garamond uh, at least one more time during the, uh, during the evening. Uh, so, uh, I, it's my privilege to uh, introduce to you Dori Gold, Ambassador Dori Gold, um, who has been uh, Israeli Ambassador to the United Nations, great scholar and writer. The book uh, which is published in Czech today uh, the Fight for Jerusalem, it's uh, not his only book. He has published several other books. Uh, I would highly recommend the book about uh, on Saudi Arabia, uh, by, uh, by the way, as well. And uh, so, so he's been advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu, to Prime Minister, late Prime Minister Sharon. Uh, so, and he's the president of Jerusalem Center for Political Public Affairs, uh, which is the key think tank and key place in Jerusalem uh, for uh, commenting the, the Israeli security issues, the Middle East issues, uh, Israeli politics, uh, uh, at, uh, etc. As, uh, as Ambassador Gold said, that he is a believer in short speeches, uh, because otherwise people fall asleep. As, uh, as, uh, but he's, he's also a believer of uh, questions and answers. Uh, so prepare your questions. I hope that this will be a lively debate uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so I'm sure that you will uh, not regret uh, that you have come uh, for this lecture and you will not regret buying the book and reading the book uh, uh, because I can confess and confirm that it's an excellent book on Jerusalem, on the issues of Jerusalem, highlighted uh, in the last month of uh, some uh, more turbulence in Jerusalem than in the, in the previous years, uh, and uh, it's worth reading, but of course it's worth visiting Jerusalem any time. Ambassador Gold, uh, the floor is yours. Well, of course, let me thank the Severo Institute for this invitation. And of course, uh, the Israeli Embassy and the Ambassador uh, Gary uh, Koren for helping make this happen. And above all, my publisher, uh, who has uh, put this out, Garamond, and was very persistent in um, pushing the idea of getting this book out in the Czech language. Um, I think it's useful when an author speaks about a book to try and share with the audience how the book developed, why I decided to put in the book the things you read. Sometimes I thought writing a book is like going to the supermarket and you have your wagon and you're going through the aisles and you decide, I need this, I need that, and you put in the wagon certain, certain products and you decide not to put in other products. So, what created the basis of this book on Jerusalem, the fight for Jerusalem? And I think the book developed because I recognized very quickly that Jerusalem is not a subject of a one area. It's not just a book, it's not just a subject of, of pure history, of pure politics, it's, or um, demographics. It brings in so many different fields and so many different uh, areas. Uh, there is the issue of archaeology, which you get right at the beginning of the book. There's the issue of recent history. There's the issue of legal rights. There's the issue of religious access. And there's the issue of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. I'm going to try and address all of these issues to show you how uh, the book was basically designed. I think what you, know, you have to have some burning reason why you write a book. And my sort of burning motivation 
was that there are many myths and misconceptions about Jerusalem and Israel's position in Jerusalem. And if you want to find the thread that ties the whole book together, it's these misconceptions. Let me begin with a story that occurred in July 2000 at the Camp David Summit, uh, which you might remember brought together President Clinton, who hosted the summit, with the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Barak, and the Palestinian leader, the head of the PLO, Yasser Arafat. And about a certain way through the summit, close to the end, Yasser Arafat turns to President Clinton and questions whether the temple, he didn't say first temple, second temple, he said the temple ever existed. And Clinton had a very strong reaction to this. He said, you know, by saying that, you're not only alienating the Jews in Israel, you're alienating the Christian world. Because I, Bill Clinton, was brought up as a Christian, and I read about the connections of Jesus and the apostles to Jerusalem. You go read the New Testament, and you see, you know, they were Jewish. They brought sacrifices to the temple. So if you say the temple didn't exist, it didn't exist, or you come up with a story, as Arafat did at the time, that the temple may have existed in Yemen, if it existed at all, or in Nablus, as he gave in another interview, that's an alienating statement. Because we're dealing with a city of three great faiths, and you have to show a certain respect to the fundamental religious assumptions of the other side. So this was uh, Clinton's very strong reaction to this, but this ended up developing, creating a whole mythology that started spreading in the Arab world, unfortunately. By the way, the original name for Jerusalem in Arabic is not Al Quds, which you hear today. It's Beit al Maqdis. What is Beit al Maqdis? Take those two Arabic words, Beit al Maqdis, and compare them to the words in Hebrew. Beit Hamikdash. It's the same word. The term, original term for Jerusalem in Arabic is the temple. And yet you have Arafat trying temple denial. The de temple denial started spreading in the Arab world like a um, firestorm through a dry thicket, through a dry woods. And you saw seminars being given in Jordan, United Arab Emirates, on temple denial. Many times they would look for European experts who taught biblical studies in European universities who wanted to prove that the Bible had no basis in fact. So these people were brought in to give credibility to this doctrine of temple denial. But what it showed, it showed how critical it was for Yasser Arafat to make his case for the Palestinians by denying the narrative and the history of his diplomatic adversary. And so part of the story of Jerusalem is this, is this controversy over historical truth. And you know, this caused me, frankly, if I can admit, when you look at the photographic section of my book, I looked for archeological evidence that we had. I mean, nobody found a plaque saying this stone is part of the temple. You know, you didn't, that hasn't been found, and, and there's a big limitation on Israeli archaeology. Contrary to myths being spread in some of the international press, we do not have, we, the State of Israel, do not allow archaeological excavation on the Temple Mount. It's not allowed, it's against the law. If we did, we might find something. But what we have found, and what others have found, for example, you have that in the, in the photographic section of my book, are plaques written in Greek that warn non-Jews that the area of the Temple Mount is a holy area. It's where the temple is. And therefore, the area is basically reserved for purified priests. It's not open to any, everybody. Well, that exists in Greek. And one of those stones is kept in uh, the main... Uh, museum in Istanbul, and we have a piece of one in the uh, Israel Museum,
but it's there in the book for you to see. And there are many more uh, elements of evidence of the uh, existence of the temple that archaeologists are finding, despite the fact that we can't go on the Temple Mount and excavate, we don't want to, because we respect the holiness of the site. There is an issue of recent history. You know, I speak a great deal in various foreign countries. It particularly helps if they're English-speaking countries, unfortunately, because that's, that's the language I speak in, other than Hebrew. And um, many times when I uh, visit Australia, Britain, United States, three English-speaking countries, uh, people wonder, you know, when did the Israeli connection to Jerusalem begin? People who start, who, who, who have some basic modern historical awareness, remember the 1967 Six-Day War, when Jerusalem, the old city, was liberated and was unified with the rest of Jerusalem. So is that when, for example, the Jews achieved a majority in Jerusalem? Some people think the Jewish majority in Jerusalem might date to 1948. It's recent. And the Jews sort of came as European colonialists to Jerusalem and eventually took over the city. But that representation of the Jewish and Israeli connection to Jerusalem is completely false. As I wrote my book, The Fight for Jerusalem, I decided to send a young student who was uh, working in London on his uh, advanced studies to the public record office. I wrote a book on Saudi Arabia based on my doctoral thesis on Saudi Arabia, which I did largely out of documents I took from the British archives. So I sent this young man to the British archives and I said, I want you to go to the consular records. There used to be, in the days of the Ottoman Empire, a British consulate in Jerusalem. There was also a Prussian consulate. The French had a presence there. But I sent him to look at the British diplomatic records. And I said, find a report by the consul general in Jerusalem about the demographic balance in Jerusalem. Let's see. You know, when did we get a Jewish majority in Jerusalem? So he found for me, and I put the actual document in the book, he found for me a diplomatic report dated 1864. What was happening in Czech Republic in 1864? Can anybody tell me? I mean, something, I just want to know where we are historically. Well, the, at that time, in 1864, there was a report that in 1863, already a Jewish majority in Jerusalem existed. That's before the British got to the Middle East, so don't look to us as agents of Great Britain. It's before uh, World War I. It's before the Balfour Declaration. How did that majority exist? Why did it happen? Because the Jewish people have been connected to Jerusalem for all these ages. For the whole period since the Roman conquest of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and the defeat ultimately in 135 of Bar Kokhba, the last Jewish general to fight the Roman Empire. So that because of that connection, because Jews streamed to Jerusalem in that period, in, for much of that period, from Yemen, from Lithuania, from Russia, from, from Western European countries, a Jewish majority was restored, and the Jewish connection with Jerusalem was established. By the time you get to the eve of the First World War, there's a massive Jewish majority. The Jews were back in Jerusalem. Baghdad was an Arab city, although we had a big Jewish minority. Damascus was an Arab city. Cairo was an Arab city. Jerusalem in the mid-19th century was a Jewish city. We had relations with our Arab neighbors, but we were already there. We were already restoring our presence in the city, and that is shown in the fight for Jerusalem, because we have to also deal with that myth mythology. I'd like to talk about the issue of legal rights for a moment, because that's something many people don't understand. You know, you have many different claimants to legal rights in Jerusalem. The original legal rights 
a recognition of the historical connection of the Jewish people with Jerusalem, of course, goes back to the British mandate. But the British were representing at the time the will of the League of Nations after the First World War. You might remember the last sovereign. Who was the last sovereign in Jerusalem before Israel? The last real sovereign in Jerusalem was the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Turks renounced their sovereignty on all the districts of the Ottoman Empire south of Anatolia, which meant that the Arab state system could come into existence. Syria could declare independence. Iraq could de declare independence. Now, with respect to Jerusalem, the um, legal status was really established in stages after the re Ottoman renunciation. You might remember that in 1947, the United Nations recommended in the 29th of November the partition of British Mandatory Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. What most people have sort of fuzzy memory of is that they recommended that Jerusalem, at the time, be an internationalized city. That's a recommendation you hear from time to time. Let Jerusalem be internationalized. So they recommended an international city. This was a recommendation of the UN General Assembly. Somebody is uh, protesting in the name of the UN. <laughs> they recommended an international city. And of course, as you all know, as with the partition plan in 1947, the um, representatives of the Arab states and the Palestinian Arabs rejected this idea. But, did, but it was still put forward by the United Nations. And fundamentally, what Israel and what the Israelis learned, we become independent in 1948, is that if an area becomes an, indep it becomes an internationalized zone, like Jerusalem, no one's there to defend it. In 1947, when uh, they made this recommendation, shortly thereafter, it, by the time you get to April 1948, the nascent state of Israel is invaded by five Arab armies. Many of them were aiming towards Jerusalem. The Egyptians got to southern Jerusalem. They were in the area of Bethlehem launching, launching artillery shells into the old city. Of course, the Jordanian Arab Legion was there. They had support by the Iraqi army. So everyone was invading Jerusalem. Did the United Nations do anything to protect the residents of Jerusalem from this invasion? even after declaring that this was going to be an international zone? The answer is no. Which is why the history of Jerusalem is so important for understanding Israeli views of promises of internationalization of its most important capital city, its most important religious site, and its most important city which became its capital. I had a personal experience with this resolution about internationalization when I was ambassador to the UN. And I tell about it in the book. At one point, the Palestinian representatives of the Palestinian Observer Mission at the UN wanted to scare us. They wanted to say, okay, if you won't come to our terms on a peace settlement, instead of demanding the borders of 1967, which appear in resolution 242, in one way or another, we're going to demand the borders of Resolution 181, the partition plan from 1947. We're not going to go to 67, we'll go to 47. And they reminded the international community that Jerusalem was supposed to be internationalized in the resolution which they rejected. I remember I had to get instructions from the foreign ministry what I should do about that. I got on the phone to our foreign minister, who at the time was Ariel Sharon. And I said, well, how do I respond to this notion that we should go back to the 47 partition plan with the internationalization of Jerusalem, which was a total failure? So Sharon gave me instructions over the phone. He said, I want you to read ben -Gur David Ben-Gurion's speech, Ben-Gurion was our first prime minister, to the Knesset in December 1949 and use his language. And Ben-Gurion said in December of 1949 that the recommendations of the UN General Assembly, it was not a binding resolution, it's a General Assembly, with respect to an international zone in Jerusalem were null and void. 
because the international community didn't do anything to protect the city. So I repeated that in my official correspondence to the UN Secretary General, who was Kofi Annan at the time. But it also, it's important to show because the mythology and misconceptions about the status of Jerusalem in UN resolutions comes up from time to time. One other point I'd like to raise, which I raise in the book, you know, um, many people point to the fact, particularly Israel, Israel's adversaries on the, in the political sphere, that um, Israel, of course, entered Jerusalem in the 67 Six Day War and then made a claim for sovereignty over the eastern parts of the city. We extended Israeli law to the eastern portions of Jerusalem. And um, those who are critical wonder by what right? By what right did Israel do this? There is a fascinating article, which of course I read right in preparing my book, by an individual, an international lawyer by the name of Stephen Schwebel. And you'll wonder, why am I quoting Stephen Schwebel, who most of you have never heard of? Schwebel wrote an article in 1970 called What Wait to Conquest in the uh, American Journal of International Law, the most important academic journal in the world in the area of international law. It's quoted in the book, in my book. And Schwebel makes the following argument. He said, you know, how did the Jordanians claim Jerusalem? How did they go into Jerusalem in 1948? They went in through a war of aggression. That's why, by the way, how their, the invasion of Israel was described by the UN Secretary General back in 1948. How did Israel go into Jerusalem, into the old city? In a war of self-defense. How do we know it was a war of self-defense? Now I'm adding some of my own observations as a former UN ambassador. Because the Soviet Union tried to have Israel branded as an aggressor in 1967. The Soviet Union and its diplomats went to the UN Security Council. The Security Council wouldn't say that Israel was the aggressor in 67. It was clear to people. Then they went to the General Assembly, which is a relatively easy place to get a majority against Israel. And the General Assembly wouldn't describe Israel as the aggressor in 67. It was clear to people that Israel responded in a war of self-defense. So what does Schwebel write in his article? If you compare the rights of one party, because it's always relative rights many times in international law, if you compare the rights of one party who acted out of aggression to the rights of another party who acted out of self-defense, the party that acted out of self-defense has superior rights. Why is Schwebel's analysis so significant? Because Schwebel, after he was an academic and wrote his article, was appointed as legal advisor of the United States Department of State. And after that, his career went further and he became the president of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And when you study international law, you learn that the, leading, the, the views of the leading scholars on international law is a source of international law. So it's a significant assessment and it also shows you that Israel has real legal rights, not just rights of conquest, but real legal rights in asserting its position as sovereign in Jerusalem. I could talk about this for hours. I'll just share with you one other little observation. Legal and historical rights. There's one other country that just translated my book, The Fight for Jerusalem, into their language. And it was China. Uh, I received a delegation about two years ago from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. They expressed an interest in the book. In the end, it was the publishing house of the Foreign Ministry of China that translated the book. And I tried to understand why were the Chinese so interested in this book. At one point, one of their representatives said the title of the book should be Jerusalem, colon, Israel's Historical Rights. I was astounded. And it seems to me that the Chinese are taking an interest in historical rights because they have territorial conflicts along their perimeter, particularly in the oceans to their uh, east, the South China Sea, where there are territorial disputes with Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam. 
But this issue of historical rights and historical claims is something which they took an interest in. And now the book has been published, and I will probably go to Beijing to do what I'm doing here in Prague. But it shows that the case that Israel makes is of interest to parties around the world. And um, the conception, the myth, the misconception that Israel does not have a historical case is simply untrue. I want to talk about the religious dimension of Jerusalem as another aspect of the book because as I wrote the book, I became increasingly aware of the danger that religious sites were facing in the world. You know, when Israelis look back on the period from 1948 to 1967, when the old city of Jerusalem was in the hands of the Jordanians, they usually recall that they lost access to Jewish holy sites. They recall that Christians found that their rights had been compromised in Jerusalem. Churches were having a hard time buying land from Jordan and from Jordanian landowners if, that they might have needed for their clergy and for their, uh, for their work. So the um, question really at that time was religious access. The question of Jerusalem and religion has now changed. And it dawned on me in 1998, when I saw how the Taliban in Afghanistan attacked 2,000-year-old statues in the Bamiyan Valley and destroyed them with artillery, with explosives. And I recognized that this, this idea that you destroy the religious sites of your adversaries or of religions you don't want to protect or accept was starting to spread in the Middle East. It wasn't just a problem in South Asia. And for example, we've seen churches coming under attack by radical Islam. Under Islam, Christians are Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, so are Jews. But the new radical Islam, this jihadist Islam, is attacking religious sites. They attack churches. The Sunni jihadists attack Shiite mosques. And it's covered extensively in my book. Israel had a couple of experiences. During uh, its confrontation with Fatah and with Hamas in the West Bank, in which, for example, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem was invaded by a joint squad of Fatah and Hamas. They took clergy hostage. They destroyed religious objects in the church, one of the holiest places in Christianity. The Church of Nativity is uh, the birthplace of Jesus according to Christian religious tradition. And yet now it wasn't protected, it was invaded. And it could have been much worse had we not successfully negotiated those terrorist cells out and got, got them to leave the church. There is in uh, Nablus, Shechem, a place which, according to Jewish tradition, was the burial place of Joseph in the Bible, Kever Yosef, invaded by radical Islamic mobs who tried to dismantle this old tomb with crowbars. It's been filmed. There's a picture in the book. And so I suggest that if Israel ever lost its nerve and a future prime minister of Israel said, yeah, you know what? Let the Palestinians have Jerusalem. If you ever did that, we wouldn't just be compromising centuries of the Jewish connection to the city, the connection of Judaism, the connection of the Jewish people for centuries to Jerusalem. We'd be compromising the interests of the international community, of the world. Now, we don't get recognition or an applause at the United Nations General Assembly for our position. But it's clear as day for anybody looking at the Middle East today. Do we stay in some kind of status quo of hostility? Do we raise uh, the rage of our neighbors about Jerusalem? Yitzhak Rabin left a legacy. You know, uh, one month before he was assassinated in November of 1995, he outlined his vision of what would be the future borders of Israel. 
Rabin had Paris do it. He, he commissioned the Oslo Agreements, and later he signed the Oslo II Interim Agreement in the White House. So he was in the middle of the Oslo process with Yasser Arafat and the PLO. And in the middle of that process, Rabin stood in the Knesset in October of 1995 and said, Jerusalem in the future should not be divided. So how did he work a reconciliation with the Arab world on the one hand and not dividing Jerusalem as many people suggested? So Rabin thought that Jerusalem is a place where we have religious compromise but not territorial compromise. Israel will not divide Jerusalem. And therefore he supported in our peace treaty with the Jordanians that Jordan continue to administer the two Muslim shrines on the Temple Mount, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And that we recognize the special Jordanian connection through their ministry of um, religious affairs, through the waqf, to the holy sites in Jerusalem. And so while this was not a religious, this was not a territorial division, it recognized a certain modus vivendi that we could have with our neighboring Arab and Islamic state. I believe that the struggle for Jerusalem, the struggle over historical rights, the struggle over archaeological truth, the struggle over legal claims, struggle over who will guarantee the freedom of Jerusalem encapsulates much of our conflict. Now, of course, Israel does not always get a fair hearing lately in the West. And that's a separate subject for a separate lecture and for a separate discussion, although there's qu questions and answers. But the people of Israel feel strongly that Jerusalem must remain united under Israeli sovereignty. Whatever you might hear if you walk through the corridors of certain parliaments in Europe today. We did a poll on this and we came with numbers like 75% of Israeli Jews see Jerusalem staying under Israel, united under Israel. Ultimately, I think the international interest in our position should be that only a free and democratic Israel will protect Jerusalem for all the great faiths. Yes, we've had our problems there, and you can ask all about the Temple Mount during, during Q&A. But it is Israel that protects religious freedom, and only Israel that protects religious freedom. And I think we understand that mission, we understand that responsibility. And we also understand that you have to respect the other, and you cannot um, you cannot establish your position by denying the historical connections of the other great faiths to Jerusalem. That's what Yasser Arafat tried to do, and that's what Israel will not do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is a microphone here, uh, so raise your hands and uh, as, uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask uh, swift and clear questions. Uh, please, no long comments. Good evening. Uh, could you please tell us if there is any legal claim already in San Remo conference over the Jerusalem or or is the legal claim over Jerusalem already only based on a defense war in 1967? The uh, language of international law is related to more recent events than events that go back a very long time, although there is a notion of historical rights. Of course, if you look at the speeches, of Israeli ambassadors to the UN, and I'm thinking specifically of Chaim Herzog, who was our ambassador in the 1970s. He would make the longer term claim. We haven't taken Jerusalem to the International Court of Justice, and hopefully we won't do that. 
uh, because I think the answers would be highly tilted and highly politicized. But it's something for us to know. It's important for Israelis to know that their claims in Jerusalem are based on a historical truth that they can identify with and not just based on recent developments that um, you know, have no roots over time. I'm Mohammed Saad from Egypt. Actually, I uh, think the uh, lecture is very biased to Israeli point of view. And uh, actually, you mentioned many different, what you call it, facts, what I believe, absolutely, it's a kind of conflict. And since it's a kind of debate, I expect that the administration of several may invite some Egyptians or some Arabs to uh, at least to reflect the other point of view. Actually, you based your argument on some, let's say, fallacy, logical fallacy, unfortunately, uh, was not right. You used even the Arabic word a bit in Magdus. The Arabs used many different words for Al-Quds, and you, you based your uh, argument on some Arabic word, one of three or four words for the word uh, Al-Quds. So, uh, beside this historical conflict, which I believe you invented many different uh, fallacies about, I would like to ask you, since you mentioned this uh, uh, kind of historical fact from your point of view and fallacy from my point of view, can you explain for me there about something? There are four million Palestinian refugees. These people don't exist from your point of view, and this Jewish city uh, came from, uh, or I mean, this Jewish roots in the city uh, uh, has the right to push out four million people, uh, let's say four million Palestinian refugees from all over Palestine. Uh, something else you, you said about the, uh, the temple. Historically, the Muslims and Arabs, they never, they never denied the temple. This is not the point, my dear. The point is that this place was occupied by many Arab tribes even before the Jewish existence in Palestine. So, excuse me, your lecture was full of fallacy, and I expect that a kind of non-biased uh, point of view from some other uh, people who have a different point of view from yours. Thank you. So what you're suggesting is that the Arab tribes who lived in what is called Palestine, what we call Eretz Israel, uh, in the period of the Jahaliya, in the period of the pre-Islamic era, already practiced Islam. So I, I have a difficult time understanding that. Um, Beit al Maqdis is one of the names of Jerusalem. But the actual study of the words indicates that the, in the Arab world it was known, in the Islamic world it was known, that a temple indeed existed. And I don't really need the language because, you know, we can just take out archaeology. I think that the uh, subject of your four million refugees is totally irrelevant for this discussion. And the reason it's irrelevant is because the discussion here is over Jerusalem. When we sign the Oslo agreements with the PLO, we identified a number of subject areas that we would have to resolve in permanent status negotiations. One of those subjects was refugees. And what happens? Another subject we have to resolve are borders, is borders. Another subject is Jerusalem. So you can't take the debate over refugees, and I would debate your numbers, and take those numbers and uh, put that into a discussion over Jerusalem. The fact of the matter is, and this was my point, that prior to the rise of Israel, 
And prior to the dismantlement of the Ottoman Empire, the Jews reestablished the majority in Jerusalem. So when modern historical consciousness emerged in the 19th century about what will happen to various territories in the world, we were there. We were in Jerusalem just as much as there were Egyptians in Cairo. And that's often forgot by people who want to represent the Jewish presence in Jerusalem as some recent development that came about because of colonialism. And if you want to speak about who were the colonialists and who were the freedom fighters, in 1948, the young Israeli Air Force engaged over Sinai the Royal Air Force of Great Britain who was protecting Egypt. And the Israeli Air Force was protecting the airspace of the young state of Israel. So my point is that who was on the side of the colonial powers and who was on the side of decolonization is sometimes a little surprising if you go into our history. But I am sure that as every institution that has speakers from different countries, I'm sure there are places you can go to in Prague where you hear the Arab point of view. Tonight you're hearing the Israeli point of view. Dari, let me ask you also, as, uh, if you look into 10 years from now, are we going to be exactly in the, situa in the same situation as we are now, as uh, looking into the Israeli-Palestinian arena and uh, more broadly into the post-Arab Spring arena as, uh, and uh, continuous chaos and dismantling of borders of many uh, uh, neighboring states or states in the Middle East. Uh, and Egypt is one of the states uh, which is uh, still kept as a state. As, uh, what do you think will be the situation relating to, no, I'm not saying the Middle East peace process, but to, to Jerusalem? What is, the, what is the projection of the Jerusalem situation in 10, 20 years? We have a Middle East which is um, collapsing. It's going into chaos. We know that in the uh, Mashrek, in the uh, um, area of the Levant, the boundaries established by the colonial powers, by France and by Britain, are no longer visible or respected. This Islamic State, which is known by its acronym ISIS in English, as Daesh in Arabic, has straddles the borders of Syria and Iraq. Syria has fallen apart. Iraq has fallen apart. The main beneficiary of all of this right now are those countries that seek to reestablish their hegemony in our region. The first and foremost is Iran, which is determined to become the preeminent power in the Middle East. Its armies are on the ground in Syria. The ones who are killing Sunni Arabs in Syria are not just Assad's forces, but Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Persians, Shiites. They are in Iraq, where they are helping the Shiite militia. And most recently, they helped topple the government in Yemen, which is actually important for you as Europeans because something like four million barrels a day of uh, oil that comes from the Persian Gulf and goes up through the Suez Canal goes through Bab al Mandeb, the choke point, the naval choke point at the bottom of the Red Sea that connects with the Indian Ocean. And that, will, that is already, in theory, in Iranian hands, but it's something the Iranians can use in their struggle with the West in the future. So we have the breakup of countries. We have new outside powers who are claiming and hope to reestablish their hegemonial position. Turkey is a more complex case, but it is also a troubling case. Um, in our relations with the Palestinians, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has gone very far in trying to make the peace process work. It's not well known, although it's been published, that um, when Secretary of State John Kerry came to the Middle East, he came with an idea to create the parameters for a future negotiation between 
Mahmoud Abbas on the Palestinian side and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu on the Israeli side. And these parameters were not easy because they contained elements that were difficult for each party. Israel expressed its readiness to accept Kerry's parameters. When President Obama, in March of 2014, asked Mahmoud Abbas, do you accept Israel's parameters, excuse me, do you accept these U.S. parameters put forward by Secretary of State Kerry? Mahmoud Abbas, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to score points on CNN, unfortunately said <coughs> that he would get back to President Obama. He never did. So many times people are frustrated with Israel. Why doesn't Israel go to peace? But frankly, it also depends on our negotiating partner. And as they say in dance, it takes two to tango. And unfortunately, Mahmoud Abbas, for his own reasons, he's afraid of Hamas. He sees Iran rising. He's not sure America is going to be in the Middle East in the future. He has a number of reasons why he should be reluctant to go forward in the peace process. Unfortunately, he's not ready to go forward. And all you can do when you lead a country is outline for yourself and to your people what are your bottom line requirements. And while you can make certain concessions and certain compromises, and you may have to to make peace, there are fundamental elements that you have to protect and retain. And that's what a good Israeli prime minister will do, and that's what Prime Minister Netanyahu will do. Any other questions from the audience? You can, yeah. I have a historical question uh, concerning the Roman and Byzantine uh, Jerusalem uh, following the destruction of the Second Temple. In your opinion, uh, uh, was there a Jewish population following the Bar Kokhba reward? When, but only following the Christian sources, uh, there was forbidden for the Jews uh, to live, to settle in Jerusalem. And concerning that, uh, what's your opinion about the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, community of Essenians on the Mount uh, Sion? Thank you. So what is the question? If, if it, in that time, in the Roman and Byzantine time, if there was in that time a Jewish population uh, in Jerusalem or not? In the aftermath of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt against the Roman Empire in 135, the Jewish population in Jerusalem and the surrounding area was depleted. And in fact, there were Roman rules and Roman laws that said Jews must not return to Jerusalem. They were allowed one day a year to come to the Western Wall and weep over the destruction of the temple, which is why it was called the Wailing Wall. Sometimes I've heard that expression. And uh, perhaps it's ironic from the uh, present-day perspective, but the man who allowed the Jews to come back to Jerusalem and settle there was the second caliph of Islam, who took a position against the Byzantine law, and the Jews came back to Jerusalem. The same process happened again later when the Crusaders forbade the Jews to live in Jerusalem. And the man who defeated them on the Muslim side, allowed the Jews to return. And therefore, the population grew. So uh, there are certain ironies of history that we sometimes forget. But in the period you're discussing, the Byzantine period, the Jewish population was badly depleted, and the center of Jewish activity was transferred from Jerusalem to the Galilee, where we had a huge Jewish presence in both the Galilee and the Golan Heights. Good evening, so my name is Martin. Let's take now three questions together, as please start, and we will make the answer. So I would like to ask you um, about your opinion. Uh, I'm a student, and last academic year I studied in Haifa, 
And um, there was uh, one professor, called, um, his name is Dan Shuftan. Sure. And um, we had really great discussions together there. And um, way before uh, those attacks happened this uh, summer, he was predicting that uh, there is going to be another intifada and uh, that the situation in whole Israel and also in um, Jerusalem is becoming worse and worse. And um, I would like to ask you, so if all the, these people also from academic sphere have such prediction, what you, like state, are going to do to not let it happen, to not let it um, become it to the point when the third intifada will, will start. Well, I don't know what the assumption opinion. is in your question. Do you assume that what steps Israel could take, that it would divide Jerusalem and that would prevent the Intifada? Um, that Israel would put more resources into Jerusalem and address the economic needs of the Palestinian Arabs living in Jerusalem? What is your... Is there a, is there a policy uh, prescription that is the basis of your question? As, as I said, I was living in Israel for half a year or more sure. than half. So I, I was there every day and I saw mm, mm, what's the situation in the north of Israel. It's not so, uh, there's not uh, too much tension between people. It's more calm there. But um, I saw that, for example, in Jerusalem, um, there are problems. Maybe they weren't visible for the first moment, but, uh, for, or, or for the first impressions, but the, there were these problems and they are there all the time. And um, if people like Dan Shuftan and other people from the university like Norman Bailey were assuming that in the uh, near future is going to be another intifada or it's uh, turning to the point of a third intifada, what's the state... Um, is going to do or how, how to fix how the state is uh, trying to fix the situation to not uh, start the third intifada well first of all let me answer your question on intifada it is my fundamental belief that what is known as the second intifada of the year 2000 that occurred because Yasser Arafat decided to inflame the situation and create that intifada and, you know, there are even individuals like his communications minister, Imad Faluji, who went on the record and said the Second Intifada did not break out because the cursed Sharon went up on the Temple Mount, but rather the Intifada was pre-planned. And there's enormous evidence for that. Do I believe that Mahmoud Abbas wants a third Intifada that he wants to give out guns and explosives to the Palestinians. I have my disagreements with Mahmoud Abbas, but I don't believe that's what he wants to do. So this is a way sometimes Israelis, Palestinians, we try and scare ourselves with threats of something that's going to happen. We may have friction. We may have difficulties. But I'll tell you what goes on in Jerusalem. Has anyone been to the Hadassah Hospital Emergency Room? Go to the Hadassah Hospital emergency room. You'll see Palestinian doctors, Israeli doctors, working on Israeli patients, Jewish patients, Arab patients, working together. I say that because sometimes Israel is accused of being an apartheid state. It's, again, that's just political jargon that's totally baseless. I had to give a speech in Johannesburg, and I asked the audience, in the days of apartheid, didn't you have black hospitals and white hospitals? Yeah. So we we'll go to Hadassah Hospital. You don't have that. We work together. Go to Malcha, the largest mall in Jerusalem. You'll see Palestinian Arabs shopping with Jews. You'll see Jordanians who've managed to come there as well and enjoy shopping in the Malcha Mall. They share the same shopping centers, the same public space. Go to the Hebrew University. Go to the student dining room. You'll see women who cover their hair like a religious Muslim in Saudi Arabia. And you'll see Jews wearing all kinds of religious garb next to each other, 
you know, studying together, eating together. So the evidence of coexistence is far greater than the evidence of an imminent intifada. I want to say one other thing. I haven't spoken to Don Shiftan in a couple of years. I see him sometimes at conferences. He used to believe in a full separation of Jews and Arabs. Uh, mayor, ben, uh, mayor Ben Venisti, who was a former mayor of, deputy mayor of Jerusalem, said to separate Jerusalem is like trying to separate the whites of the eggs from the yolk of the egg after the omelet is made. We're mixed up. It's all mixed up. There are people who believe that East Jerusalem is green and Muslim and West Jerusalem is blue and Jewish. So just divide Jerusalem. Blue on one side, green on the other side. Well, if you want to give a, a really bad paper that's inaccurate in a political science course, write that. It's just not true. We have Jews living in Arab neighborhoods. We have Arabs living in Jewish neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. It's mixed up. It can't be divided. And of course, people have strong passions on this subject and will say all kinds of things and they'll write an op-ed in a uh, newspaper, in The Guardian, in Haaretz, you know what? Even in the uh, other papers that have a more conservative view like the, uh, you know, uh, the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal. But the truth of Jerusalem is that we are a society. We are a, a, a city with Arabs, with Jews. Israel must provide security, provide the elements of coexistence. And frankly, if we have been faulty, we have to put in more resources into Eastern Jerusalem. And ultimately, I believe at the end of the day, Jerusalem will be united, how would you say, 40 years from now? That's my, that's my prediction. Hello, my name is Veronika Kukinova. I work at the MFA. If, uh, you, you have been a diplomat. You worked uh, for, uh, with the European diplomats. What, in your view, is the biggest misconception or are the biggest misconceptions EU as a whole has about Jerusalem? And what uh, would you think uh, is the best way how to, how to counter that? Thank you. Well, Many times, there are European diplomats who go back to these old documents, like internationalization of Jerusalem. You know, would they like to internationalize Berlin, or internationalize Paris, or internationalize any city in Europe? No. And so, these ideas are put forward, or that somehow Resolution 181 from 1947 binds the State of Israel. It was a General Assembly resolution. Anyone who knows the UN knows the only thing that's binding international law is a Chapter 7 resolution under, uh, in, in the UN Security Council. So, but th these are small items. The problem is that Israel is often not understood. One of our difficulties, and I think this may be connected to the lack of patience with Israel today, we unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005. And most people would expect that when you withdraw from territory that the Palestinian side is claiming, that the level of hostility and violence would come down, would be reduced, because you're addressing a grievance that you keep hearing. No more army, no more settlements, you've addressed it. But in fact, violence got worse. And that has required, because our cities have been hit by Hamas rockets supplied by Tehran, because of that, we have had to re-enter the Gaza Strip in three large military operations in 2009, 2008, 2009, in 2012, and just recently in 2014. The press gives a lot of coverage to these events. And there are many who make false accusations against the State of Israel, even the UN Human Rights Council. But this creates a lot of frustration because many in Europe say, well, this is occurring right next door to us. What can we do? So some people say, you know what? Let's recognize a Palestinian state that doesn't exist. So you hear that a lot of parliamentary action lately in certain countries like Sweden, Britain, France, 
Normally you recognize a country after it declares independence. That's what you did in Kosovo, South Sudan, East Timor. But here you have recognition given to a country that doesn't exist. There may be good intentions behind it. So what I'm saying is that you see in Europe a readiness to accept a lot of misconceptions. But what's necessary is to have a real dialogue with Israel. And Israelis have tremendous respect for European civilization. For Europe. Many Israelis come from Europe. We have a common cultural heritage. We have common, co common values. But if that dialogue doesn't exist, or if it only exists with part of the Israeli political spectrum, then you're not getting the complete picture. So I, I, I've somewhat carried on further and made this into a separate little speech because it's a big subject. But I think that uh, Israel has a just cause. Let Israel make that argument and then make a judgment. So we have two questions here. What's up, Baron? <clears throat> I have two short questions. First one, very practical. Uh, what are the conditions of access to Temple Mount right now? And second question is, did uh, Israeli archaeologists uh, make some progress in stipulating more exactly the location of the temple? Is it still the theory that it was located a little bit north to the rock? Or is there some progress in the location? Thank you. So the first question, what is the current status of the Temple Mount? There was a status quo on the Temple Mount for many years. And it was established in the period when Moshe Dayan was our defense minister. And basically it recognized, as I said before, that the Ministry of Religious Endowments of Jordan, the uh, Ministry of Aukaf, Waqf Affairs, would administer the Muslim holy sites. Now, there's something that makes it even more convenient, from a, that's a coincidence, that in fact under Jewish law, it has been commonly accepted that Jews should not walk on the Temple Mount until someday in the far future when uh, we have priests, Kohanim, who have been purified by the process described in Jewish law, who can again go on the Temple Mount and uh, resume the ceremonies of the Temple. But in the meantime, the great rabbis said we shouldn't go up there. There have been rabbis today who say, you know what? Don't go to the place where the temple was or the Holy of Holies was, but you go on the Temple Mount if you're on the periphery of the Temple Mount. That represents a certain change in the status quo. But the bigger change in the status quo actually is from the Muslim side. In 1996, the Israeli government was negotiating with the Waqf about opening up the end of an archaeological tunnel, not on the Temple Mount, on the side, the Hasmonean Tunnel. And the Waqf, the Palestinians on the Waqf, the religious leaders said, you know what, we have something we need and we'll, we'll agree to this. We want to be able to go into the subterranean areas under the um, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and have a place where Muslims can go, an overflow crowd can go in the event of rain. Seemed like a reasonable request. Israel agreed to that. Later, Arafat accused us of trying to undermine the foundations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's a complete fabrication. It was on the side where we opened that archaeological tunnel. It was a pre-existing tunnel. Um, but since that time, the situation on the Temple Mount has been difficult. It's been difficult because um, huge amounts of unsifted archaeological dirt, rubble, was removed by Muslim authorities from the Temple Mount and then thrown in garbage sites in Jerusalem. Our archaeological experts have gone through that material. And um, sometimes we have violent groups that will go up on the Temple Mount lately with fireworks, sometimes with rocks, and throw rocks at the Jewish worshipers in the area of the Western Wall. The Temple Mount overlooks 
the Western Wall. That requires us to take police actions, which we believe is, are, we're fully entitled to, but we don't like doing. So there are tensions there. If men of goodwill can sit down and work them out, we'll work them out. But we will not allow violent groups to get on the Temple Mount, create riots, and threaten the peace of Jerusalem. One of the worst groups we have is what's called the uh, um, Northern Branch of the Islamic Movement in Israel, headed by a man by the name of Sheikh Raid Salah. His family is a Druze family that came from Syria, and they, he converted, they, they converted to Islam. Raid Salah is what we call in Arabic an Ikhwani. He's from the Muslim Brotherhood. He's supported financially by uh, Sheikh Yusuf Kardawi in Qatar. And he has been behind a lot of the problems on the Temple Mount. Israel made a legal case against him. He got off in an Israeli court. But he is a figure who has caused a lot of the problems in Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, he will be brought before a court again. But... Um, you know, the entrance of the Islam, radical Islamic factor into the Temple Mount is very dangerous. And it's something Israel, with our neighboring countries like Jordan, have to uh, prevent so that we can have stability and religious freedom in that area. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that I'm learning a lot because I, uh, I'm not the expert about your region and about uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm not claiming that I really uh, uh, would so be able to answer some of those questions you were asked here. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you as a historian, uh, but as an ambassador, uh, as a representative of your country, the United Nations, and uh, the person who is uh, uh, dealing with the international affairs. I have no doubts about the historical evidence that Jews were living in Jerusalem. I have no doubts uh, uh, that the, uh, Israel is the only real democracy in the wide region. Uh, but I'm really quite uh, puzzled and, uh, well, uh, uncertain uh, what, uh, what we can do, and you as a state of Israel and your allies, to do with the growing uh, extremism uh, among the Muslims. Uh, you have mentioned radical Islam, uh, when we see it from Taliban to Al-Qaeda and now the Islamic, Islamic State. Uh, it's, it's worse and worse. It's, it's growing. Uh, the aggressivity is growing and uh, uh, the methods are even more brutal. Uh, how to stop it? Do you have any idea if it could be? I, I very much appreciate your optimism about uh, this period of 40 years where Jerusalem would be united uh, again. And I know that this is based on the historical knowledge that people from different regions could live peacefully together. But once you see and you wit witness the, the growing aggressivity of radical Islam, what would be your prediction? Well, first of, first of all, let me draw a fundamental distinction that we have to keep in mind. This is not a struggle against Islam. I told you that the Jews returned to Jerusalem because of the uh, noble charity of Muslim leaders in history. Jews, when we were exiled from Spain, uh, were welcomed in the Ottoman Empire. And um, Ottoman sultans had Jewish advisors who sometimes were rewarded with land in places like Safed. The, the city, the, the, lar the large city in the, in the Galilee. So the problem is not Islam, because sometimes people fall into that view. The problem is radical Islam. We have an irony today. I believe one of the most terrible movements that has damaged the Middle East is an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. I have seen so much written by Arabs themselves in Arabic newspapers, talking about how all of the great radical movements, jihadi movements, are products of the Muslim Brotherhood. When I speak in America, I always ask New Yorkers, in particular if I'm speaking in New York, 
Who was responsible for 9-11? Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Where is he from? Where did he grow up? Where did he get his education? Muslim Brotherhood in Kuwait. He grew up in there. Ayman al-Zawahiri, who was associated with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. What about Abdullah Azam, the teacher of Osama bin Laden? He was Palestinian, but he left the whole issue of the Palestinians, and he became involved in the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, Syria to some extent, and in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood was the fountainhead for much of the radicalization we're seeing. And you see in Arabic newspapers people saying this. Now you have this irony emerging today. In 2007, and again in 2009, a select committee of the British House of Commons recommended that Britain enter into a political dialogue with the Muslim Brotherhood. You have individuals in the American political system who make the same point. Yet today, the Muslim Brotherhood is illegal in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates, in Egypt. Because they know what they stand for. They support jihad. They support describing other Muslims as, uh, as people who don't no longer live up to the faith and therefore can be killed. They understand the danger. But unfortunately in the West, there are naive groups of people who believe, no, the Muslim Brotherhood, it's an alternative to Al-Qaeda. It's not the fountainhead of Al-Qaeda. So I would say there are two things we have to do here in the West. Number one, we have to make sure we don't generalize and allow the battle against the Bin Ladens and the Zawahiris to turn into a war against Islam. That is wrong. That is a mistake. But number two, don't let radical Islamic groups distort things and um, have us believe that they are actually moderates when they're not, when they call for the destruction of your society. By the way, that's happening in the case of Iran. Iran is on the verge of getting nuclear weapons. And how many people have been seduced by the smiles of uh, Hassan Rouhani, who basically has no power on the nuclear issue, but nonetheless he gives interviews to CNN. So understand what you're dealing with. Study the truth of what's going on around you. And come with a respect and honor towards our Arab and Muslim neighbors so that we can coexist. That's what I can recommend from my uh, perspective. Well, Ambassador Gold, I would like to thank you. Yes, uh, I would like to thank one more time the Garamond uh, Publishing House for publishing your book. Uh, maybe they will publish more <coughs> of your books uh, and books of other authors on the similar topics, uh, as they are doing, by the way. I would like to thank the Israeli embassy uh, uh, for bringing you here yes, uh, and others who have supported this event. And uh, you could read their names and logos on the screen. Yes, uh, I would like to ask you as... Checks not to be shy, and if you want to get book signed, then you can attack Mr. Gold with the book, and he will sign it with his pen or with the several pen. As, uh, the Israelis are not shy; sometimes we are uh, too shy to that. So there is going to be some time for do, for uh, doing that. And I do thank you very much for coming today. I do thank everyone for supporting this event, and uh, one more time, I do thank you for uh, having the lecture here and answering the questions. Thanks a lot.